Hey everyone, welcome to Sum Zero. Uh, normally, we like to talk about uh, stocks, but as you know, we we love bringing kind of differentiated um, uh, sort of investment insights uh, to all of you. And today, we've got uh, a very interesting um, uh, founder with us, Anthony Zhang from Vinovest, um, which I, I just think is fascinating because it's a company that that sort of facilitates wine investing, uh, which is not something I think most people are. Um, uh, super familiar with, you know, as an asset class, but I think, you know, if you were, if you asked Anthony, this is, this definitely is an asset class and one that's emerging and one that has a lot of potential. Um, Anthony, great to have you on some zero. Um, I, I love what you're doing. Um, just full disclosure. Um, I'm myself, not, not exactly a big drinker. Um, so I'm not, uh, maybe the most versed in, you know, all of the nuances of, uh, um, you know, the industry or the wine industry. Um, but, you know, I've spent most of my adult life, um, you know, investing in the public markets and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, broadly across equities, real estate, crypto and, and other asset classes. Um, so I, I think this is like a really fascinating um, story. Just before we get into it, um, tell us about yourself. We're, we're you know, you know, where did you start out your professional career and, and how did it lead you to, to, uh, to wine? Yeah, Divya, first of all, it's great to be able to chat and, uh, um, thanks for welcoming into the Sun Zero community. Um, so yeah, everybody, I'm, I'm Anthony, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Vinovest. Um, as you mentioned, we're a, a platform that helps people invest in wine and, uh, my professional career definitely did not start out in wine or investing. Um, I started out as an entrepreneur, and uh, built my first business when I was a freshman in college. It was a food delivery app for campuses and uh, was fortunate enough along the way to be able to um, secure VC funding. Uh, I got an award called the Teal Fellowship from Peter Teal and uh, was able to actually drop out of college to fully pursue that business. Um, I was able so to- what, what was the, uh, did he give you like 100K or what was the award at the time? Yeah, it, was the, uh, it was the 100K grant. Uh, it's pretty much no strings attached. The only condition is that you have to drop out of school. So I was a sophomore in college at that time. And, uh, you know- it, And you were at sophomore, USC, was it? I was at USC, yeah. So for me, it was the most money I've ever seen. I was like, holy crap. Like if a billionaire is telling me to drop out of school, I got to do it, right? School can always be there. I can- Put my credits on hold and this opportunity to really go all in into my business is one that i can't pass up you know if if, if um if we had time we could we could probably do a whole discussion on the peter thiel scholarship and the merits of you know, you know higher education in america um but just really quickly did you ever yeah, end up going back yeah. to school or you you dropped out and you stayed out yeah uh credits are still waiting for me at sc many many years later yeah. um, right but, you, yeah, you've always you've got the uh, the you know the honorary doctorate in the workings. Um, <laughs> Working hard on that. Uh, exactly, exactly. Um, so, what was that first? Um, what was that first company that that Peter Thiel funded? So it was called Envoy Now. Um, essentially, like an early DoorDash, Uber Eats model, but we were only focused on campuses. So we were able to uh, not only utilize students that had free time in between classes to be our labor but um, also be able to leverage uh, campus points, be able to leverage uh, the .edu email for additional security and, and community controls. And that enabled faster deliveries, friendlier deliveries, and more virality on a dense small area like a college campus. So uh, we were able to scale that business out, uh, grew it to over 20 markets nationwide, hundreds of thousands of students using the app before we ended up selling it um, to, to what became a subsidiary at Walmart. Wow. Um, and then what was the next, uh, the next business? So <laughs> next, next venture was a little bit more of a passion project. It was called Know Your VC. Um, so this was back in 2017 when, um, you know, in, in Hollywood, the whole Harvey Weinstein scandal was going down, right? There was just these uh, terrible allegations of, of him really abusing his power. And in Silicon Valley, there was a parallel narrative playing out but just had, had way less press. It was a lot of VCs that were being accused by minority founders or female founders or founders from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds on just being taken advantage of, harassed, discriminated. Um, and to me, um, it, was, it was something that completely took me by shock. You know, fundraising as an entrepreneur is already hard. And then the fact that 
a lot of my, my peers had to go through so much more. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. Was, um, you're right. That's definitely not a story that's, I think, hit the mainstream, but it's almost like, it's almost like not a surprise um because yeah, i because you know, the dynamics are so similar right it's like the dynamics you know, are completely hollywood huge. director you have all the power you have all the money you have all the decision right right right, Same with right. VC, right it's all closed door it that's so that's so interesting i you know i've never i mean i'm i i can speak from firsthand experience in terms of like just the the feeling of having to raise money and just how daunting that is Mm -hmm. um, I think any entrepreneur um, who's, you know, been around for even a short amount of time knows uh, just how frustrating that can be. Um, but uh, so what, what happened there? Did, did you end up taking some of this to the press or was it funding litigation or what, what was the Yeah, So it, it turned out to be a platform similar to like a glass door. So uh, we had entrepreneurs rating VCs, we had VCs rating other VCs, you know, that I co-invested with. And we essentially just created this platform that encouraged transparency. Um, you know, we were the platform that vetted the reviews that was able to substantiate the claims. Um, and just because of the social climate at the time, that site blew up. We we're getting hundreds of thousands of unique searches on different VCs every single month. And that business was, was bought out pretty quickly um, by, by Rate My Investor. And, you know, like rate my teacher, rate my professor, that whole, that, yeah. that yeah. I'm sure was helpful to many, many college and high school students back in the day. And then was, was VinoVest the next venture or was there something in between? Yeah. So I, I was, um, you know, Nerd VC was never a full-time endeavor for me. I was in the crypto space actually at a, a, a cryptocurrency portfolio management company called Blockfolio. Um, yeah. That was when I just started falling in love with the alternative space, right? I was, I had, was fortunate enough to sell my first company. And after that was, was angel investing and uh, dipping into real estate and dipping into crypto. And um, just through being in the crypto space, you meet a lot of really interesting individuals and um, ones who um, were actually in, investing in wine. And to me, that was such a foreign concept. I was like, what, you can, you can invest in wine, but you know, I've always maybe known about people with big wine cellars and I had the idea that they were worth a lot, but never really thought of it as an asset class until then. Um, and then when I looked at the returns, you know, it's double digit annualized returns for the past three decades, really low volatility, low correlation to global equities. I was like, hey, like, even regardless of anyone's interest or passion in wine, this is a pretty yeah. attractive asset class that anyone should take a look at. It, it feels a lot like, um, you know, the art market or um, even like the exotic car market. Uh, totally. where there's not a lot of liquidity, but people who are in a position of, of, you know, having the wealth to, to accrue some of these assets and people who know the right people, you know, can avail themselves of some of these opportunities. Um, totally. And, and that's the thing, like I was not connected in the wine industry. I was definitely not wealthy enough to have a massive wine cellar. Um, so it was tough. I realized there are a lot of barriers to entry for for an everyday investor to be able to get started in the space. So how did you get started or what was your, like, what was your angle on this? It was, it was really brute force. I, I, I was going to auctions myself. I was uh, looking at different wine investment funds and options out there. And um, none of them really suited what I wanted out of a platform, right? I wanted something that was online that took care of custody, that took care of access, that took care of uh, pricing and liquidity for me that I can be able to transact just like, you know, anyone would on their brokerage platform. Um, I didn't see that out there. And um, moreover, I saw this huge lack of data and insights from an investment angle in the wine world, right? I think Sum Zero is, is so incredible because you have the power of the community being able to share insights and be able to help everybody learn and, and get better. But I didn't see that same uh, platform exist in the wine investing space. It was either just critics talking about tasting notes, which is completely different than, you know, analysts talking about buying and selling a wine, right? And uh, for me, coming from the crypto angle, a lot of the trading was just purely algorithm. And I started, uh, me and my co-founder started putting some of these crypto algorithms onto the wine market, back, test, back testing it, then live testing it, and realized we had a model that even though we were not wine experts by any means, we were being able to, to beat out the market. And we're like, yeah, hey, that's pretty cool. Let's, let's, uh, let's lean into this. And 
you know, one thing led to another and we got to the point where friends were asking us if they could invest their money with us. And we're like, whoa, I think we might have something on our hands. You started out investing in wine using your own personal money, like Mm -hmm. you your own funds. And then, um, you know, as I'm assuming as you were thinking about this, you you know, scale was uh, a a big sort of question mark and something you wanted to figure out. Like, so how do you bring this to the average investor? Um, So just walk me through the platform. You know, if I sign up, um, what do I need to do to, you know, start to build a, a wine portfolio through, through Vinovest? Yeah. So as a retail investor, um, your experience is really similar to working with a traditional robo advisor. So you would, um, get asked a few initial assessment questions, right? Regardless of the asset class, you probably want to know how big of a position you're planning on taking, how long do you want that uh, duration to be before you exit? And then also your risk appetite and what else you're investing in, right? If you're, if you're in a super aggressive investor looking for a short term or medium term, like three to five year uh, entry and exit versus someone who's, you know, just looking to let this ride and maybe have it be more of an evergreen investment. Uh, it's a totally different mix of lines, right? Because just like stocks, there's your large cap blue chip lines and there's your emerging market, maybe more speculative lines. So based on the investor preference, our algorithm will then start to allocate and build a portfolio for the investor. We actually go out, we work with wineries on sourcing, on pricing, and on actual authenticity, making sure the wine is A, authentic, B, in great condition, and C, is stored and insured properly within our, uh, within our storage facilities. What, what are All the minimums? Uh, are uh, there any minimums? Yeah, so minimum right now from the retail side is $1,000. So anyone with 1000 bucks can, can test it out with, with a smartphone, no knowledge of wine, no knowledge of... Uh, or no need for even storage, we'll handle everything for you. And our goal is really, as you get started with your wine investing journey with us, to give you the insights, to give you the knowledge and the analysis for you to eventually, if you wanted to, be able to make your own trades and investment decisions. Could could an individual investor who has you know a few thousand dollars of disposable capital they want to put in, can they invest in say a hundred thousand dollar bottle of wine in a fractional way or or like, can you pool people's money to kind of um, allow smaller investors to invest in the, the, the more kind of blue chip stuff that they would not be able to buy, um, you know, individually? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So on the main platform, Vinovest, you're actually just owning the bottles and cases yourself. So individual investors have individual custody. However, we are uh, on the fun side allowing investors, accredited investors, the ability to do that, right? They can buy into a larger pool of funds um, and be able to share um, a piece of that larger portfolio. So even if they're putting in, say, a few thousand dollars, they're owning a part of that, you know, sort of hundred thousand dollar blue chip bottle, uh, along yeah. with all the other investors. This is so interesting to me. What so in the stock markets? I mean, there's something like ten thousand stocks. How many different bottles of wine? Like how how big is this market in terms of the, you know? Do you think of it as like? Uh, do you think of each bottle as a stock? Or do you think of each bottle for a given vineyard in a given year as a, st- as, a as a stock? And, yeah, and it's, so, how many are there? yeah, that's that's a fascinating question because it totally is. Um, even give an example of a well-known wine in the US, like Opus One, right? Um, their 2013 may be a completely different risk and return profile than their 2014 because of things like supply, because of things like critic score, because of things like how they're timing their release into the market um, and consumption demand. So when we are looking at individual wines, it's it's on a per vineyard, per vintage basis as well. And also sometimes on a per size. So for example, uh, if a vineyard is making uh, 10,000 cases of just a standard 750 milliliter bottle, and then they're making 100 cases of a magnum or a double magnum, right? Those have very different supply and demand characteristics. And also um, just, from, just from a consumption standpoint, those those supply curves go down in different ways. Do you get any um, uh, sort of economies of scale being a platform on the buying side? Like, do you get any discounts because you might be buying, you know, a hundred bottles of something as opposed to one or two? Yeah, so Vinovest is one of the largest wine buyers in the world. Um, And that has allowed us to be able to get really preferred pricing as well as relationships with these wineries on getting not only the uh, volume, but also the 
pricing that we want to be able to pass it on to the investors, right? Because in a game like wine, it's really about your, your entry point and being able to hold until that maturity date. And if you're getting in at, you know, say 90 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, you already have those gains kind of locked in for your first few years. Right. Um, now, if I'm just an individual not accredited, um, and I'm, I'm basically using Vino Vest to, to buy a specific bottle or a specific case, um, and you guys are handling custody, am I charged a fee for that, the, the, the custody part of it? And yeah, that's correct. So we have just an all-in-one platform fee, ranges from 2% to 2.8%, um, and that handles everything from you know shipping to custody to authenticity, insurance as well on the wine while we store it for you. Um, yeah. and all of that is kind of included. Can I have that delivered? You could, because because it's your wine. Um, you can do whatever you want with it. So um, for folks who are actually planning on um, maybe 10 years down the line, right? They buy a case for their kid's birth year, or maybe an anniversary yeah. year, right? Something special. Um, a lot of a lot of folks choose to maybe take some profits off the top and enjoy that wine too, down the line. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a unique... Um, it, it's a unique investment relative to say buying stock because like you could just consume it <laughs> and yeah. get sort of a, like almost like a non-financial utility from it, you know, sort of like owning, like, you know, if you own residential personal real estate um, it, you know, it, it has, it has both financial value, but also it has a utility, like with, utility, with yeah. gold, maybe back in the day, you could actually do something with it as well. So it's kind of cool to have that, that utility, which is also, I think uh, led to some of the, more of the, the stability and the lack yeah. of volatility in the asset class too. So, so if I log in to VinoVest and I, you know, if, if I'm thinking about this as like a, you know, a Schwab or a Robin Hood, um, mm -hmm. they're typically with public, publicly held securities, there's a mark. Um, is, there a, is, there a, is there a mark to market on your bottle of wine that you could sell at any point in time? Exactly. There is. Um, and that's something that we at Vino Vest have tried really hard to create because given even though how large and old the wine market is, most of these transactions are still offline. It's a very uh, traditional industry. And at Vino Vest, we've been working hard to be able to bring all these transactions online, all these data points on sales, all these data points on trades and secondary market transactions. We're able to aggregate it, normalize that data and show the investor like, hey, Someone in China actually bought your exact bottle for X amount of dollars yesterday. That's your most recent mark. Or someone in North America just bought the bottle again. So we're able to show these trades and data points where you know, it's nowhere near as liquid as the stock market where there's a ton of intraday trading. Right. But on, on the most liquid wines, you can expect to see multiple trades a day as well. And, and, and where are you getting that data from? Like, How do you know that somebody in France sold that bottle of... Cabernet for a certain, I mean, I... so we're bringing a lot of these merchants uh, transactions online. So we're, we're developing these relationships. We're working with these uh, wholesale retail distribution channels, and we're seeing all of those sales prices. Um, so we pulled all that data and we clean it and we put it into our system as a globally aggregated uh, net asset value. Cause you know, not only do we want to show you the price in North America, but the price in Asia and the price in Europe and, yeah. Oftentimes, there's a lot of variance just given given different laws and, and currency fluctuations as well. What's the rough um, total value of all of the wine that you have in custody today? Uh, so I think in terms of total value of wine we have access to, we're just we're just south of a hundred million dollars now. And and you and you're so you're physically holding a hundred million dollars worth of wine. Now, is this, is this like in California? Is this around the world? Like wh where is all this being? So the facilities are around the world. Uh, we've established uh, warehouse points next to major wine growing regions as well as next to major wine trade hotspots. So yeah. growing regions like Napa or, or Bordeaux or Italy, and then hotspots like uh, the UK, like Hong Kong and Singapore as well. So interesting. What what's the split between sort of the individual investor who's buying, you know, who's essentially a segregated account on your system versus the folks who are actually investing in, into your fund structure? And related to that, what is what's the fee structure for the fund? Yeah, great question. So the fund structure is relatively new. We just started offering them earlier this year, so still the majority of our assets are on the the individual retail investor side. Yeah. Um, 
but we do see the sort of fund side getting larger and larger as we as we grow the company's track record and assets. Um, and the fee structure is very similar to a traditional fund, right? We've got um, our, our management fee and a carry, um, and that depends, um, ranging from you know 1.5 percent management fee, 15 percent carry, um, to a little bit higher if we're doing more bespoke funds for individual, say, RAs or family offices that want a specific strategy. So most people are just looking to get global exposure into wine. Some folks are like, hey, like I want only champagne or I want only French wine, right? And they're able to make a more focused bet into the market. Can you speak to some of the returns that you've seen? Um, you know, where have you seen maybe the, the, the highest capital appreciation in the wine industry? Is there a specific vineyard or... Like, I'm just curious what in your portfolio has really taken off. Yeah, I mean, Champagne for the last two and a half years has been the best performing region for us. We've got several Champagnes that are up triple digits year to date, even. Wow. Um, so we have a few that are extremely, uh, extremely explosive. But I'd say if we're looking at the average portfolio performance, last 12 months, I believe we're just a little bit north of 25% after fees. The, 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 the different, the Champagnes you're referring to, um, being up triple digits now, is that like people coming off COVID being like, I just, I want to go party. Like, I don't care what it costs or like, what, it might be a little bit of that, right? Like, like what's going on? Yeah. I, I think it's that. I think it's also because of climate change, like, um, you know, this is an agricultural industry, right? They can't physically make more grapes out of their, their piece of land that they own if they feel bad weather. And especially in recent years, there's been a lot of frost, a lot of very volatile weather, um, in the Champagne region and in, in the world in general, that's, le that's led to lower yields, um, so lower supply, and they have to be able to know that like, hey, if this Champagne needs to age for another eight years, um, you know, these new releases are going to have a lot of scarcity and pent up demand. So consumers are seeing that, they're panicking, and they're buying up all of the older vintages as well, because they don't know when they can get their next bottle. And to your point, right, COVID's uh, opening up, although it seems like we might be going back in again, um, and, right. and enjoy. Well, I always thought of alcohol as sort of, or alcohol and spirits as like sort of this, at least in theory, as something that is counter cyclical or at least uncorrelated because like whether, if anything, like if, if the economy is doing poorly, like maybe some people want to drink more <laughs> or, yeah, or, you know, definitely one of the last goods to, to suffer yeah. during a recession, right. it's good times, right. bad times you want to drink. Yeah, I, I mean, I that, that's one, one one would think that, but maybe with COVID, um, there's there is somewhat of a bounce back effect just with pent up, you know, demand. Yeah. I mean, online well, alcohol sales have soared through the roof just since since the start of COVID, right? Because people they can't really dine like they used to, but they still want experiences. And as more of these wineries have shifted online, uh, we've, we've we've seen a huge huge surge of demand and interest of, of yeah. folks wanting to. Are, are you seeing the same with um, with spirits? Like, is there any reason why you couldn't move into that sector or subsector as yeah, well? So we're actually uh, branching into rare whiskeys. So these would be us. Uh, barrels of scotch, Japanese whiskey, as well as American whiskey and bourbon. Um, and they, they share a lot of the same properties, right? Because you have that scarcity, you have that supply and demand factor. And then you have the aging process that correlates really highly with, with price increase as well. Yeah. Now your fund... Uh, which I think would be applicable to, um, I and mean, we have a lot of accredited investors in our community, including a lot of family offices. Is that an AI driven fund in terms of um, its, its wine selection process, or is there a human who's guiding yeah. decisions? So, so we do have an IC, but most of our decisions are going to be um, surfaced by the AI. So we're, <laughs> we're the ones still being able to monitor and manage it, but most of those decisions are what we trust our algorithm to do. Okay, so with normal money management, you know, when you're thinking about stocks, um, you know, there's, you have different valuation or, or investing frameworks. I mean, some people are more value driven. Some zero community members tend to be pretty value driven or, or you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're typically fundamental in terms of how they invest. But then there are obviously a lot of folks who are more momentum driven. Is the model does it have a, a flavor of investing to it? Or, I mean, like what style of investing is it, is it trying to achieve? Is it, is it more momentum driven, more value driven? If it's value driven, what, like what data is driving its fundamentals? Yeah. Great question. Uh, 
I think wine as an asset class is inherently value driven for long term investors um, because things like uh, brand brand equity, right? Things like aging potential, things like supply and demand over time are are very much things that take a long time to build up and and a long time to be able to to see the future too. So yeah. for, for our model, we're we're looking at wineries and you know these these wineries they've been producing wine for 50, 100 years, right? So you have yeah decades worth of comps when you're like, hey, like this is the the year 10 appreciation price. This is the year 20 appreciation price of old models. And then we can see what the comparative value is for more recent vintages. And yeah. that is what we see as a, a really <clears throat> high uh, correlation factor with, with price improvement and performance. Um, and then on top of that, we're layering in things. Uh, on the momentum side, it's really going to be external factors, right? If it's a, if it's a, a new tariff, right? Or if it's um, if it's a, even someone like LeBron posting a photo of a, of a bottle, right. That actually does move the market, um, in some way. So, um, on, on the human side, that's when we look for the momentum. Got it. Who yeah. are the, uh, well, what are the, the fangs of the wine industry? Yeah, I, I love that question. So I would say kind of the fang equivalents are going to be in Bordeaux and Burgundy, right? These are kind of the, the birthplace of wine, uh, your first growths in Bordeaux, which are the highest five classified wines are going to be Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Latour, uh, Chateau Mouton, Chateau Aubryon. Um, these ones, um, Chateau Margaux, these ones are uh, wines that since 1855 have been classified as the world's top wines. They're consistently among the highest ranked. They're consistently, um, you know, appreciating in price, whether it be five years down the line, 10 years down the line, even 50 years down the line. Mm -hmm. And they're ones that have huge global demand. Um, especially fueled by the Asian market. Really interesting. Um, and with these particular blue chips, um, if I guess we can call them that, like how much uh, volatility is there in the return profile? Like, would, are, are they, I mean, are, are you basically saying that these are like steady 10% a year growers that they just will compound at a fair, or, or is there a lot of dispersion in those returns? Like, you know, some, some year, is it like, you know, the NASDAQ uh, in, in, in that sense where it's like some years it goes up 30%, some, some years it's down. Um, it's, a, it's a lot less volatile. Um, I, I think um, last time we kind of pulled the numbers, the average volatility of uh, the wine market, which, you know, most of it is going to be in Bordeaux and Burgundy supported by those blue chips is less than a third of the volatility of global equities. Wow. So the drawdowns are pretty low and minimal. Um, even yeah. during the 08, 09 recession, uh, it was just a 12% drawdown on, throughout, throughout that year and a half period. Yeah, I feel like I should be doing this. Um, so uh, in terms of um, the disruptors, I mean, are there, like who are the disruptors in the wine industry um, to kind of, where there's potential for them to enter that um you know, that, that echelon of, of sort of top tier wines. Um, yeah, great question. I think um, there's, there's really two main catalysts. Number one is if there is a change in ownership, right? If a conglomerate like, you know, LVMH, they buy up a winery, you know, they're going to put a ton of resources into hiring the best winemakers, using the best growing practices, best marketing, right? Yeah. And really kind of creating that luxury brand. That's why they, you know, they own a, a pretty incredible portfolio of wines already. Um, the other is if there's, uh, say, a change in classification. So, um, you know, in, in Bordeaux and, and critic scores, they've got different tiers. If there's, say, a tier two winery that gets upgraded to a tier one, you know, it's similar to an analyst issuing, issuing a rating, right? A double A to a triple A. And yeah. that does inspire a lot of investor confidence and, and the price action follows as well. And, and how deep are these markets, like the, especially the, the blue chip markets? I mean, could I go on VinoVest and buy like a million dollars worth of wine that that would fit into this blue chip category? Yeah, absolutely. Even on a single, the, even on a single blue chip, you could buy a million dollars worth on a on a single vintage. And then if you wanted to diversify, you could be buying up, you know, last five years, last ten years of supply as well. Um, so you can even go vertically with your exposure deep into one winery or spread across different blue chips when you're looking at. Um, your, your risk profile. Can you do that without moving the market? Like what's the, what's the daily trading volume on, you know, the Chateau Lafitte, for example, like what, 
any sense? Yeah, I would say a million dollar buy would not yet tip the market, but say if you wanted to buy 10 million, it would, it would have to be some sort of OTC spread over chunks to be able to yeah. not move the market. And do you guys have an OTC desk? <laughs> I, that, I would that, I wouldn't go as far to classify it as an OTC desk, but since yeah. since most of our our traders, you know, we're starting with these offline relationships, you know, a lot of these sort of big bulk buys we're doing are are you know are essentially OTC. Uh, although we're we wouldn't go as far as to call it that for us. I don't think we're there yet in terms of sophistication. Yeah. So tell us about the business. Um, in terms of uh, just your investors, did did you self fund the business? Did you or did you raise outside capital? Uh, yeah, so we, we're venture funded. Um, we've raised a little bit over $16 million to date. Um, have some great backers like Tribe Capital, Silicon Valley Bank, and um, some industry heavy hitters, both on the asset management side, like you know, BlackRock, and as well as on the wine side. A lot of big, big conglomerates like Diageo and Suntory and uh, LEMH. We've got high level executives there who have personally invested in the business. Got it. And, are, and who are your main lieutenants at, at VinoVest? Um, so I've my, my co-founder and I, Brent, uh, we worked together at our last company, Blockfolio, which was the crypto portfolio management company. So he's our head of design and products. And, um, you know, really all credit goes to him for designing an awesome user experience to be able to get, you know, tens of thousands of folks who've never heard of wine investing into the space in an accessible way. Um, and then we've got an awesome leadership team, you know, from, from ops to sales to engineering who have had experience at, you know, the largest of companies, you know, your, your fan companies on the tech side, and then working for publicly traded fintechs and, and um, you know, pre-unicorn companies as well on the tech side. Really cool. How, how many employees do you guys have now? Um, it, it's crazy to say this, but we're, we're almost at 40 employees now. Wow. Um, the company is a little bit over two years old. That's cool. Um, has Diageo been helpful? Um, on the whiskey side, we definitely have I've gotten some pretty valuable relationships through our angel investors there. Um, so when we do publicly launch those next year, um, mm -hmm. that'll really help on, on the sourcing side because they pretty much, you know, they have a huge market share in the fine whiskey market. And is there anyone else doing what you're doing? I mean, is, I, I don't know of any, but I'm curious if there are any other kind of wine platforms, you know, market platforms like this. Yeah, I think the, the real competition comes from legacy players. Wine investing is, is not new. Um, it's really, I think, been a lot more um, accepted or, or, or kind of more part of the history in Europe, where I think wine is just naturally a little bit bigger part of the culture and society there. So most of our competitors are UK based, you know, they're, I think they are really aiming toward um, a, a much more high level audience and an audience that I think already is expected to have a certain level of knowledge in the wine world. Yeah, um, all of us is really targeted toward the everyday investor. Like, I don't care if you drink or even like alcohol, look at the numbers. It should be something to at least consider. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's what appeals to me. Um, what's the uh, average age of the typical VinoVest user? I would say they're um, an older millennial, right? So mid thirties, maybe early forties. Um, and then, you know, they've, you know, they've, they're experienced in the market, right? They've got their stock portfolio, maybe some real estate and crypto. And this is just another piece of diversification to add to their portfolio. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like when you're tired of, uh, you know, um, the like crypto and the NFT stuff and you, you need kind of something new, this is a, this is a really good place. And, and this one won't give you a heart attack every morning when you check your phone because <laughs> you are a lot less volatile. No, that's, you know what? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I've, I've, I've personally gone through that with crypto. I mean, I, I remember what, cause I, you know, a lot of us went through crypto winter in 2017, 2018, oh like you're yeah, looking at that 90%, and you're just like, uh, you, you almost don't want to know. Um, yeah. You look and your, your screen's all red and you're like, oh, damn it. Right. Yeah. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> like back, back to the day job. Um, yeah. Anthony, this is great. Um, love what you guys are doing. Uh, you know, it seems super differentiated. It almost seems like the kind of concept that you almost wonder like how someone else hasn't, hadn't thought of this earlier, which I, and I find that a lot of times those are, those are some of the best businesses. Um, so, you know, kudos to, to you and your team for, for uh, figuring out how to make this, um, you know, accessible to, to uh, you know, everyday investors. So, so thanks again for joining us and um, looking forward to being in touch. Yeah, David, it's a, it's a pleasure. And thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it.